You see, part of the great struggle that we have today is that there are people who sit in church pews week in, week out, day in, day out, who are lost. There might be somebody here tonight who is religious. You attend church services. You might even have a program of reading your Bible. Question, are Muslims religious? They put most of us to shame. How many of you take five times out of your day every day and pray? They do. Religiously. I was traveling through uh, the, the Far East and I was in the country of uh, Malaysia. And in that part of the world, it's really interesting, no matter what room you go into, you will look on the ceiling and you will see an arrow. Every room you go into, no matter what it is, because they want you to know what direction Mecca is so you can pray. Every room you go into, doesn't matter. You go to Israel, it's fun in Israel because on Sabbath you will go into a building and you will experience a Shabbat elevator. You know what a Sabbath elevator is? You don't press any buttons. It goes to every floor. So if you go in a 69, uh, you know, you're on the 69th floor, you're going to stop at all 68 floors on the way up because they consider pushing a button on the Sabbath to be work. You're going to find people that are incredibly religious all across the world. But there is a vast difference from being religious and being made righteous. As a matter of fact, there's a passage of Scripture, and I believe that this takes place at the great white throne judgment. There are going to be people who address the judge of all the earth, and not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, and that's very important. Anytime you see the word two times, it is an incredible emphasis shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many. How many? many. How many? many? Did you ever stop to consider that? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Everybody look up here and everybody listen to me. Do you understand that there are preachers who are going to go to hell forever? Didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we stand up in front of large crowds and didn't we prophesy in thy name? In thy name cast out devils. All kinds of amazing, bizarre, strange things done in the name of religion and religious meetings. Cast out devils. In thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. As a matter of fact, most people ask the wrong question. Tonight, I am not going to ask you, do you know the Lord? <laughs> I could ask, oh, yes, brother. Wrong question. My question is, does he know you? You can tell me all day long you know Jesus. My question is, does he know you? Jesus said, depart. And by the way, that's the Greek word ekbalo. Literally, it is a fast pitch of a baseball. He is going to cast them into hell so quickly. Depart from me. I never knew you. There are seven conditions that do not prove or disprove genuine saving faith. What do I mean? Visible morality. 
Can you have standards and be lost? You can have all kinds of visible morality and there are all kinds of religious groups with all kinds of codes of conduct and codes of morality. You can have a code of morality, but that does not prove or disprove. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be frankly honest with you, within the realms of fundamentalism, there are numerous groups that want to stand up and wave their flag about all the standards that they have. That does not prove or disprove that you are converted. It doesn't. Visible morality. How about this? Intellectual knowledge. Here, let, me, let me blow your mind with something. How many of you remember a man by the name of Stalin? Joseph Yosef Stalin. Stalin. Do you know that Stalin murdered upwards of 60 million of his own people. Uh, oftentimes, we get all torqued about, uh, about uh, Hitler and him killing 6 million Jews. Stalin murdered upwards of 60 million of his own people. Let that sink in for a moment. Do you know that Joseph Stalin could quote the first five books of the New Testament from memory? He could quote Matthew, he could quote Mark, he could quote Luke, he could quote John, he could quote the book of Acts all from memory. Who in this room can do that? You think Joseph Stalin had some knowledge, some facts about God? There are people who sit in pews day in, day out, and they've got a mind packed with facts, but having facts does not prove or disprove that you've ever been genuinely converted. You can know the answers to the trivia games, but that's not uh, the, the reality. As a, as a matter of fact, as you go on down here, religious involvement. You know one of the most amazing things? How about Judas Iscariot? <laughs> he preached. He was involved. As a matter of fact, you know what's really stunning? Who was the most trusted man in the group? He was the man who held the bag of money. He was the most trusted individual. And you know what the Bible says in the book of Acts? He went to his own place. He was lost, the son of perdition. He had all kinds of, oh, I, I taught Sunday school, I do this, I do that. See, that's why I said a few moments ago, you will either answer based on something you have done, or you will answer based on something that Christ alone could do. Religious involvement does not prove or disprove that you are genuinely converted. I don't know what I just did. There we go. Number four, active ministry. Judas Iscariot, and these are passages of Scripture that go along with that. Number five, conviction of sin. Question, can you be intensely convicted over sin? Does that prove or disprove that you're genuinely converted? Almost you persuade me. I want to talk about some deep conviction. He was incredibly conviction, convicted, but that does not prove or disprove that there is a genuine conversion. How about a feeling-based assurance? How many of you have ever woke up and not felt saved? <laughs> People like to give, you know, warm little fuzzies and, oh, you know, when you do this, remember the words you prayed. Can I tell you something? The words you prayed did not save you. There was not some kind of magic wolfy dust and you prayed those, said those words and okay, zip, boom, I'm, I said the words. 
That's why I never lead anybody in a prayer. I tell them to call upon the name of the Lord as the Spirit of God is drawing them. I don't give them words to say because that is absurd because later they're trying, well, did I say the right words? Can I tell you people often say, when does somebody actually get saved? People come down an aisle and, you know, sit with them. We, we walk them through the plan of salvation and then we pray with them. That's the moment of their conversion. No, you know when the moment of their conversion was? The moment that their heart turned to Christ and the gospel was the moment of conversion. And yes, we do call upon the name of the Lord. And yes, we're not ashamed of the name of Christ. But so often people say, well, I remember the place I prayed. Who's the emphasis on? Me. Here's what I did. Careful. And then number seven, a time of decision. Let me ask you a question. Can you make a, can you make a decision and it not be genuine? One of the most amazing passages of Scripture that people get tripped up over and don't understand is Mark chapter 4. Jesus says in Mark chapter 4, there are four kinds of ground. And I'm going to tell you something. Don't come up here and argue with me afterwards because you will not change my mind one iota. I think there's a whole group of people that just want to give a nice little warm fuzzy answer because they don't like the alternative to exegete the scripture and actually say what the text means. Mark chapter 4, Jesus says there's four kinds of ground. There's the first kind of ground that hears the word, Satan takes it away, it's gone. Second and third kinds of word, both of them make a decision. And it seems genuine. I mean, they seem like they're on board. But in time, both of them go away from Christ. And you know what the point is? Neither one of them were saved. It wasn't backsliding don't you try to dilute yourself. I have heard preachers stand up and say, oh, they were genuinely converted, but they just backslid. No, you missed the whole point of the text. Jesus says the only one that is converted is the one where the seed fell on good ground. I pay people say, oh, Brother Kevin, then where is backsliding in the Christian life? Read the text. Jesus said some produce 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. There's your struggle in the Christian life, in the good ground. But the only one that's converted is the good ground. That's the only one that is genuinely saved. You can actually have a time of decision. Here's the truth. I made six professions of faith before I was converted. I got in a lot of trouble as a teenager, and let me tell you something. When I had some run-ins with the police, I was masterful at making decisions to try to get out of trouble, but I was not converted. Interesting time of decision. Well, that's exactly what goes on in the text that we are looking at tonight in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 9. The Apostle Paul wants us to understand and remember in verses 1, 2, and 3, he says, beware of the dogs. Those are people that basically are incredibly religious, and Paul was one of those dogs, which is a play on words, and I turn on the heart of, of unsaved Jews. And so Paul says in verse number four, he says, if you think you've got anything to brag about, if you think you've got anything that you could stand up and say, "Woo, look at me, I'm something else. He said, I want you to pull your life next to mine. And he said, I want you to listen to my list. You think you got something that God's impressed with? You think God's really impressed with you? Look what he says. <clears throat> Paul begins this way. He says, first of all, circumcised. On what day? Now, do you know that sometimes they try to fudge around with that because they couldn't quite make it to get the baby circumcised on the eighth day? So the priest would just kind of say it was the eighth day. Paul says, no, 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 not with my family. 
He says, we were such religious, passionate Jews. I wasn't circumcised on any day but the eighth day. Circumcised, he wasn't circumcised at the age of 13 like an Arab. He wasn't circumcised any other time. He said, I was circumcised according to the strict requirements of the Old Testament law, circumcised on the eighth day. You think you've got something God's impressed with? He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day exactly the way the law says I should. Secondly, Paul says, I am a bloodline Jew. He says, I am a blood line Jew circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. You know what's really interesting about Jews? How many of you have ever been fascinated by Matthew and Luke, those genealogies going back? Isn't that fascinating? Jews are obsessed with genealogies. Why? Because if you are related to Abraham, that is impressive to God. He is the friend of God. If you are a blood-born Jew, I was telling the people this morning, we were over in Israel and I was kuchikuing a baby. And it was an Orthodox Jew, had the hat on, the curls, black coat, whole thing in Israel. And I was kind of, you know, just kind of playing with his daughter. He had a stroller. He looked down at her and said, tell the dog to go away. Tell the dog to go away. They've gotten incredibly cocky because they think God's impressed because they're related to Abraham. They are overwhelmed with whether or not they are a bloodline Jew. There is no half-breed in Paul. Paul's no Samaritan. Paul says, I am a blood-born Jew. Top that! You think you've got something that is impressive. Then he goes on and he says, not only that, I am from the tribe of Benjamin. By the way, here's something maybe you did not know and didn't understand. Paul did not have his name changed. He didn't have his name changed. Every Jewish boy was born with two names. They were given a Roman name and they were given a Jewish name. What was Paul's Jewish name? Saul. And by the way, what tribe was the first king of Israel from? The tribe of Benjamin. They loved to name their kids after famous historical figures in the nation of Israel. He was named after the first king, but he was also given the name Paul at his birth. That was his Roman name. And when God called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles, which is comical, (laughs) it's just comical. You got a Jew who has now been called to be the apostle to reach the Gentiles. That's just God's sense of humor. He already had the name Paul, and he used his Roman name because that was something that would help. But Paul says, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. You say, what's so big about that? Well, let me tell you something. When you look at the history of Israel, you had unto King Saul, you had David. There was the combining of all the tribes in this coalition. And then you had Solomon. And after Solomon, you had a split in the kingdom. Jeroboam and Rehoboam. And you had how many northern tribes? And how many southern tribes? And who were those two southern tribes? Judah and Benjamin. Do you know what their nickname was? The loyal sons of God. They were seen as guardians of the law. They were seen as anchors of truth. Paul says, you think you've got something that's going to impress God? He says, I am one of the loyal sons of God. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. I am one of the two anchor points in the nation of Israel. We never left. We never moved. We stayed firm. But it gets better. (coughs) Paul goes on and says this, Hebrew, literally in the Greek, Hebrew beyond Hebrews. That statement, friends, is 
incredible. Now, I want to tell you something. How many of you know whose feet that Paul sat at? Gamaliel was a very famous, world-renowned teacher in Israel. As a matter of fact, you remember Gamaliel? They were all shook up about what was going on with the church. And Gamaliel stands up and says, guys, if it's not of God, it's going to die out. If it is of God, you are dumb to fight against it. Just let it be. Gamaliel was a very wise, discerning man. And Paul is sent as a young man from Tarshish down to Jerusalem to sit at the feet of this world-renowned teacher called Gamaliel. Do you know that the Jews in the Temple Mount Institute in Israel still have writings of Gamaliel? And here's what Gamaliel says. He does not mention the young man by name, but Gamaliel says he had a young man who was in his tutelage, in his school, who had the entire Old Testament from memory. You know who most historians believe that young man who sat at the feet of Gamaliel was? Now do you understand why he is the youngest member of the Sanhedrin in the history of Israel? Now do you understand why he was a part of the Council of Seventy? Now do you understand why he was going to be the watchdog to destroy the church? There had never come along a more brilliant legal mind. He is believed to have had a photographic memory. He saw it permanently there he could reproduce it he is touted as one of the six most intelligent men who have ever walked on planet earth this is not brag friends this is just fact paul says the bottom line is i was beyond any hebrew that had ever come along in the history of israel he said i was beyond all of my countrymen they couldn't hold a candle to me and that's why Paul became this unbelievably powerful young man. Why they laid their coats at his feet when they stoned Stephen and he consented to the death and he saw the church as the enemy and he was going to destroy it with all of his might and all of his vigor. Hebrew beyond Hebrews. He said, as far as his theology goes, he was a Pharisee. Now, in the first century, there were a number of schools of thought as far as Pharisees go, but there were two major schools. There were the Pharisees. How many of you have ever heard of the word political conservative? Whether you know this or not, in Israel, religion is their political system. They are a theocracy. So you would either be a Pharisee, that's a political conservative. By the way, I've actually had people try to tell me that they're going to go to heaven because they're a conservative. I've had people try to tell me that they're going to go to heaven because they're a liberal. And that would be the other side of the coin. If you were a theological, political liberal, you would be a Sadducee. See, the Sadducees didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in afterlife. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't really believe in much of anything. That's why they were so Sadducee. Some of you will get that later in the week. But you would be one of those two parties. Paul says, you want to know what I was? He says, I was a political conservative. I could argue the point. Nobody could best me in debate. I was a Pharisee. And then you want to talk about zeal. Paul was zealous on steroids. Let me ask you a question. Just how religious was Paul? He's having people executed. Now, Everybody is shaking their heads saying, oh, what's going on in the world? All these, these Muslims, don't, un, don't lose track. Basically, what you got is 500 million Apostle Pauls. Religion 
is their basis of wanting to dominate the world. And that's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted the church gone. And he says, you know how zealous I was? Persecuting the church. I preached a message uh, through the book of Philemon, that one little chapter. And I began the message with 21 words that define Paul before conversion. I'm going to tell you something. He was a brilliant and very nasty, angry man. And he wanted the church destroyed. He was zealous on steroids. But here's what makes things intense. Paul says, concerning God's Truth, law, blameless. Question, did Paul have a lot of knowledge? Yes or no? Did he know every sacrifice that the Old Testament law called for? Did he know every detail about every sacrifice? You know what Paul says when he ends this text? He says, according to the law, I have kept every regulation. I have done every sacrifice exactly when it's supposed to be done. I have done it just like clockwork. So here's Paul's point. Are you impressed? Here's what I did. Now. Paul begins by giving his self-righteousness, and he says, here's what I've done. But then Paul does something so incredibly glorious in this text. It is amazing. Secondly, Paul's self-righteousness is denounced. (laughs) Verse 7 is the key. What things were, say it for me, Gain to me those I counted loss for Christ. Now, how many of you still have a checkbook? Cultural dinosaur. <laughs> People have check, still have checkbooks? When my mom, when my dad passed away, we had a time... Because my mom's philosophy, because she didn't know that there was another part to the checkbook called the ledger. So her philosophy was, if I still have checks, I still have money. So we had to take the checkbook and take it away because it was not a very good scenario. You see, the whole point is these two words that Paul uses in this text are incredibly important. Gain, what things were gain, those things I counted loss. The word gain and loss are financial terms. And whenever you see those two words, what you need to think of is the ledger of a checkbook. Because here's the point that Paul is making in the text. Over here, he said, look at my checkbook. Circumcised the eight days, stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, add it all up, draw your line, carry the one, and I am a spiritual gazillionaire. Look at what I've done. One day, on the road to a city called Damascus, Paul was going to see if he could smoke out some more Jews who believed in the way and take them back to Jerusalem and make them pay the ultimate price. And on the way to Damascus, The Bible says that a light shone from heaven. The people around him fell down. He was having a face-to-face conversation with Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to him, Paul, it's tough for you to kick against the goats. My personal opinion is that Paul listened to the gospel from a man by the name of Stephen, and deep in his soul, he could not shake the reality. 
He knew that he had all this external righteousness, but his heart was empty. And on the way there, and by the way, Paul is the kind of guy that would have believed that God was impressed with him. Yes or no? I mean, he was shiny. He was real shiny. He looked really good. God's going to be impressed with me. Look at my checkbook. How many of you have ever been audited before? That ever happened to you? I've been audited. Oh, man, that's fun. You got to bring all the receipts and all the ledgers, and they want to go through and know what done. Well, here's what happened. On the way to Damascus, Paul got his account audited by Jesus. And let me just say, Jesus was not impressed. Not at all. Circumcised the eight days, stock of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, touch the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, not impressed one iota. As a matter of fact, you know what all your righteousness is, Paul? And by the way, this is the Hebrew term, and it's... Indelicate, I know, but the Hebrew term in Isaiah is all our righteousness is like filthy menstrual rags. That's the Hebrew term. Whew. Paul understood in one moment that all he had done and all he had accomplished and all he had worked so hard to do before God was absolutely and totally irrelevant, meaningless, worthless, and less than worthless because what was gained to him left him bankrupt. And by the way, that word loss means to be bankrupt beyond any hope of getting out. There was no way out of the bankruptcy in which Paul was found. And you know what? People sat in the church and, oh, they struggle because, well, was I good enough today? Did I try hard enough? Well, can I tell you something? Salvation never depended on anything you could ever do. I've had people ask me, are you going to go to heaven because you're a preacher? Absolutely not. The only thing Kevin Brownfield deserves is to go to hell forever because I was born in sin. I was born in violation of God's truth and that's all Kevin Brownfield deserves is hell. And if I was going to count on my own righteousness, carrying it before the Lord and saying, Lord, see what I do? I feel so sorry for so many people who even attend fundamental churches because they somehow in their mind think that God's got this scale and he's going to weigh it out. Yeah. Well, if I'm, if I'm good enough, if I try hard enough, if I do better, never depended on any of that. Yeah. What was gained to me, I counted loss. And that's the third part of Paul's incredible testimony in this passage of Scripture. If I can ever get this thing, there we go. The last part of Paul's testimony is that the righteousness of Christ was deposited. Imagine, Paul is on his face and he cries out, Lord, what do you want me to do? Instant conversion. Absolute transformation in that moment. Everything Paul thought about himself, all of his accomplishments, everything was wadded up. It was thrown in the trash can. And Paul came to God as a filthy, stinking, wretched, broken, lost sinner. Which, by the way, is the only way you can come to God. There is no other way. You're not going to try harder and get better. How many people in giving the gospel ever heard, well, I'm going to work on it and I'll, I'll try again. And no, 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 no. The only way you can come to God is as a filthy, stinking, wretched, broken, lost, hopeless sinner. And in that moment, he will wrap you up in what you cannot produce. 
in what you cannot manufacture. He will give you his righteousness. You see, my friends, the only correct answer to what must I do to be saved is there is nothing I can do because Jesus already did it. It is only coming in broken repentance as a lost sinner to Christ at the cross. One of the greatest pictures is from that wonderful wordsmith in the Pilgrim's Progress. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Exactly. Do you know that he pastored his church for 12 years? A lot of people know about Pilgrim's Progress. You know that he wrote 58 other books? He is a wonderful treasure for the modern Baptists. And it's kind of been lost because he's tough reading. They, they talk differently. They thought differently. They wrote differently. But I'm going to tell you something. I love that picture in Pilgrim's Progress where Pilgrim comes to the cross and that stinking pack on his back. He doesn't unbuckle it. He doesn't do anything. It just falls off his back and rolls down into the grave and it's gone. Wasn't anything Pilgrim did. That's the grace of God in Christ, my friend. Oh, can I tell you the absolute wonder and joy of truly being in Christ. And it's not based on anything you can do, ever could do. It's not based on words you prayed. It's not based on kneeling the right way. It's not based on whether you did this or didn't do that. It is when your heart turns as a filthy, stinking wretch to the gospel of Christ alone, that is conversion, my friends. And that's what happened to Paul. So tonight, if when you were talking, you said, here's what I said, here's what I did, you better think it through. Is your faith in Christ alone? Because here's the point. If your faith is in anything other than Jesus Christ, period, If your faith was in a camp that you went to, if your faith was in a series of words you said, if your faith is in anything other than Jesus, you're lost. Anything other than Jesus. He is the only hope. And I love what verse 9 says, being found in Him, not having my own what? There is nothing I could do, nothing I can say, nothing I can produce. There is nothing that I can do that is going to impress God. Absolutely nothing. The only thing that impresses God about me is that I am wrapped up in the righteousness of Jesus, and that is it. Period. End of discussion. Paul says, being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. All those things Paul said, look what I did. He said, but the righteousness of God by faith in Christ alone. Religious? Or have you been made righteous? You say, how do I respond to a message like this if we're all God's people? Well, First of all, if you're here tonight and you've been religious and you've never been made righteous, my, uh, my uh, call to you would be as fast as you can run to the cross of Christ and the gospel as a filthy, stinking, broken, wretched sinner come to Christ alone, period. Secondly, sometimes we as believers, we lose Our joy, we lose all kinds of things and we forget just how much God paid. And he, God, made him Jesus to be sin who knew no sin that I might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 